you know, about the only way to explain a marriage. I think if you asked any marriage that had been in existence for a long period of time, I think that they would all look back and, and echo the sentiment of that song, that at different points they'd both been broken, but they were broken together. And that, that is, that's truly because if you think of what marriage is, it's the ultimate example of the grace of God that two people who are incomplete on their own, two people who are sinners on their own, two people who are in perfection on their own, come together and create a union of one that is still imperfect, but yet glorifies God in its union. And so marriage in itself uh, is amazing. Let's pray this evening. Dear Heavenly Father God, uh, we just ask that you would help us Father, just help us to focus on your word, help us to focus on your truth, and help us to become better husbands and better wives, Lord, by learning to be more God-honoring in our roles in our marriages, Lord God. For those that are not married yet, God, open our eyes and minds that, that we would be prepared for the day when, when we would be, Lord God. And it's in your most precious heavenly name. Amen. And so the topic of the role of women in marriage and in family is one that often inspires glances and smirks uh, from men. Anytime you say, turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians in the fifth chapter, men suddenly become Bible scholars that cannot remember where any other verse in the Bible is mentioned. But suddenly they hear Ephesians 5 and they go, oh yeah, this is the one where you're supposed to submit. I remember this one. Submit to me, honey. Wives, submit. Men become Bible scholars and quoting scripture. Now they don't quote the rest of Ephesians 5, but they can remember verse 22 like nobody's business. And it's also a term that brings about uh, quite a bit of discussion and debate, uh, perhaps more than, than, than any other topic in terms of family and marriage is, is the submission of a wife. What's it supposed to look like? How's it supposed to play out? And so tonight we will discuss that topic, uh, attempt to clear the air a little bit uh, on a woman's role in marriage and, and try to kind of educate and just, and just kind of talk about it a little bit. So uh, last two sermons we dealt with men. And we said that the command from Scripture was simple for men. Men, love your wives. We were only given one command. That's all we were given. We said that that was probably because we weren't all that intelligent and couldn't handle a list. So we gave one command, love your wives. Then he goes further and says to define the way that we are to love our wives, we are to love our wives the way that Christ so loved his bride. And so tonight we move to women. Now I've got news for you women. As much as you like to complicate things and as much as you like to write things down and make lists, as much as you like to make it difficult, as much as you like to huddle up and have a discussion about what the proper role of a woman might possibly be, your command is equally as simple. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Just as simple as men's was men, love your wives. Wives, your command is equally as simple. Submit to your own husbands. Now, we had two sermons on loving your wives. We've only got one on submitting to your husbands. I'm assuming, women, that you can get it twice as quick as the men got it, okay? So submit to your husbands. You see, Paul and God knew that you were not much sharper than us, so he just gave you one command as well. So let's put this in context real quick as we get into it. First, we must understand verse 21 before we can get into verse 22. We'll be in Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 24 tonight. The title of this message is Spirit-Filled Women. So how do we have Spirit-Filled Women in our church? But let's look at verse 21 real quickly as we get a little context. It says, Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, Paul is coming out of talking and walking in love, walking in light, walking in wisdom, uh, how to be wise, not to be uh, drunk with wine, to be filled with the Spirit. And so he's talking about all these things, and he says to be filled with the Spirit, then there's going to be this, this part of it that comes that we're going to have to submit to one another. And that's what verse 21 talks about. So the overarching theme of submission, if you'll remember from this morning's message, we talked about being humble enough, humble like Jesus, humble according to our example of Jesus the Savior, 
favor that we would be humble enough to put ourselves under one another. And so for women, men, all included, pastors, deacons, elders, Sunday school teachers, newest church members, everybody included, a believer, there is an element of submission in the believer's life. Submitting to the Lord Jesus, submitting to the leadership, and submitting to one another. Being humble enough to submit to one another. And so we have to remember that overarching theme. Paul's writing and he says, submit to one another in the fear of God. Submit to one another because it's what God has called you to do in order that you would get along as a body of believers. You have to be able to submit to one another. And then he goes on to define it a little closer. He begins to deal with marriage. He relates it to Christ in the church. And he says, wives, submit to your own husbands. That word submit, remember it's the same word that when we talked about the men's submission to the Lord, it literally means, it's the, the military word, hiptasso, it means to put oneself below in rank. So it's the military term, it be the idea of I'm going to submit myself to the one above me in rank. I'm going to fall in under them and I'm going to let them take the lead. And so women, what it says is women, allow your husbands to take the lead. Women, come under your husband in rank. Don't try to pull rank on him because he is your leader. So submit to your husbands. And so take on the mindset of a servant. Now a couple of things I want to point out about submission that it's not. It's not becoming a doormat. All right, That doesn't mean there's nowhere in scripture where it says women you should lay down and let your husband, husband trample over top of you because you're not worth it. That's not what it says. As many husbands have tried to lord that over their wives at different times. That's definitely not the command from scripture. It's also not telling you to remain silent while your husband goes outside of what is God honoring and what is biblical. If your husband is leading you down an unethical or immoral or ungodly path, then no, you should not follow. You should follow God first. All right, So let's be clear about that. But within the foundation of this marriage, if you'll remember, we talked about that within the foundation of the marriage that we're talking about, both spouses are believers. Both spouses are believers. So they're both seeking to honor God with their lives. They both call God the Lord of their lives. They both call Jesus their Savior. And so if that is the case, then wives, we submit to our husbands. Now I would go a step further as to say wives, even if your husband was not a believer, one of your strongest tools of evangelism could be to serve him in a submissive manner. But we'll discuss that another time. But nonetheless, for the purpose of Paul's writing, he is talking to believers. How is a marriage God honoring? Well, when the husband and wife fill the role that God has called them to. So let's look at a first few truths about submission from the Word of God. And first we see in verse 22, and it is this, the submission of wives starts with submission to Christ. Wives... Submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. As to the Lord. Think of the image of Jesus that we discussed this morning. Think of the image of Jesus as he leaves the, the, heavenly, the heavenly places. As he leaves and he puts on flesh and he humbly takes that on. And he comes down to serve all of the creation. The creation which hated him so much. And he submitted to the will of the Father. That, women, is your example of submission to your husband. How that Jesus left heaven and submitted to the will of the Father. Even though Jesus was equal. Even though Jesus was fully God. Even though he was equal in deity. Even though he was equal in importance. Even though he was exactly on the same playing field as God. He still submitted himself to the will of the Father. It certainly doesn't mean that Jesus was no longer equal to God. It just means that he's honoring God with his submission. He was glorifying God with his submission to the Father. And so, ladies, your command to submit to your husband stems from that thought process. The main reason, ladies, that you should submit to your husbands, the main reason that you should submit to your husbands is not because he deserves it. The main reason you should submit to your husbands is not because he's worth it. It's not because he's so good or so pretty. Liet, I know that's going to throw you off. <laughs> Partially because we're so pretty. Not any of that. It has nothing to do with him. The reason that you submit to your husband is because it's the will of God. Yeah. That's it. Reason one. Why should a wife submit to her husband? Because God's word says so. 
How do I stay in line with the will of God? Well, if you're, a, if you're a wife, then it's by submitting to your husband's leadership. Now, it doesn't mean that you've made yourself unequal to him. It doesn't mean that you've made yourself lesser than him. But instead, it says that you are willing to follow the divine plan that God has established in his word. In God's precepts, when he pinned down the word through the apostle Paul... The precept was that wives would submit to their husbands, and that would be how they would fulfill the will of God in their lives. I'll go a step further. Resisting the authority of your husband, ladies, resisting the authority or undermining the authority of your husband is resisting the lordship of God in your life. So when you resist your husband or when you undermine your husband and his authority in your life, you are essentially saying, God, your will is not important in my life. I'd rather have it my way. I'd rather do my own thing. I'd rather go my own way. This idiot doesn't know what he's talking about anyway. I'm sorry, Miss Sue. <laughs> so if that's the case if that's the case if the case is that the will of God is that woman would submit to man and his authority then why is it such a struggle to submit to the authority of a man why is it, why is it such a, a, a struggle sometimes now I know I'm speaking to a lot of holy women in this place tonight and you don't have any idea what I'm talking about but for those who you'll be talking to this week and trying to talk about what a spirit filled woman does I want you to know that it's a struggle to submit to your husband whether you care to admit it or not it's a struggle because in Genesis 3.16 part of the curse of a woman as a result of fall of man into sin says that the woman shall desire for her husband and he will rule over you. Part of the curse. So we have the, the serpent and he tempts Adam and Eve. Eve eats the apple. She takes it back to Adam. He eats it. God comes around. He curses the serpent. First he curses the serpent. He said you will crawl on your belly the days of your life. You'll eat dust. Everything will trample over you. You'll be the lowest of the low of the creatures in the world. And he looks at woman. He says you'll have pain in childbirth. Everybody remembers that one. Every time a, a lady has a child they remember the curse of Eve. They remember the curse of the fall of man but they, they want to forget the rest of the curse and the rest of the curse says you will be under the authority of your man and you will struggle with that because you will want the authority that he's got because see everything was broken in the garden. Everything was broken when sin entered. The perfect plan was that Adam was there and he created Eve and she was his helper and all was set in place and everything was good and Eve knew her role and Eve knew what was going on and everything was perfect and then suddenly it was broken by sin and since that time there's been a power struggle. Women no longer want to submit to their husbands because they're not sure their husbands are worth submitting to. Men no longer want to love their wives because they think they may want to love somebody else more. They don't know what they got going on and so the roles of men marriage are, are twisted by this world but I got news for you it doesn't matter that the roles of marriage have become twisted by sin what matters is that the roles of marriage are defined in scripture we're not allowed to contort them to what we want them to be we're only allowed to know what they are and what the word of God says is whether you want to or not wives you are to submit to your husband and not to submit to your husband is not to obey the will of God in your life Now, men, sometimes we make it awfully hard for our wives to fulfill their role of submission by the way that we live. I said I was done picking on you, but I'll never be done picking on you. Remember, one of the things we talked about in loving our wives properly means that we want to cleanse her with the way we live. We want her to be in the will of God. Well, one of the ways that we can show our wives to live in the will of God is by being a man worthy of following. By living a life that your wife can follow. That she doesn't have to lead you because you lead her in the ways of the Lord. Wives, your husband's merit has nothing to do with your submission. You submit to your husband because that is the will of God for your lives. You want to know how to live a spirit-filled life as a woman? Then submit to your husband. We could stop there, but we're not going to. So first is it stems from our submission to Christ. Second... We find in verse 23, ladies are to submit to their husbands because the man is the head of the wife. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 
Sometimes to get past the struggle with submission, ladies, we got to lean on the knowledge that, that first we're not really submitting to man for our own thing, but we're submitting to him because it's the will of God. And then the realization that the headship of the man, it's an image of Christ as the headship of the church. And so when you think about that image, you think about that image of Christ as he heads the church. And that's exactly how man is to head a marriage. It's not something that, that the scripture says man is to become the head of the household. It doesn't say that man is to earn the headship of the household. It doesn't say that man is to earn the right to lead his wife. It says that man is the leader of his household. And so when we talked about men, we said, well, which direction are you leading your wives? Well, wives, which direction are you aiding your husband in? Because you're not the leader of your household. And if you are the leader of your household, then your household isn't honoring God. And that's just the fact of the matter. Think of Satan for just a second. And I'm not calling women Satan, although it could be accurate sometimes. Not my wife, by the way. No, no, no. Angelic is the best word to describe my wife. But for those of you who are not blessed with Liette in their lives, think about Satan for just a minute with me. What was Satan's original sin? What was the original sin that Satan had going on? It's that Satan wanted to make himself equal to the Most High. Satan wanted to make himself equal to God. He wanted to be a, not above God, but as high as God, as important as God, in the same role as God. And then think about Satan's temptation of man. He wanted to be equal to God. He was cast out of heaven. He was definitely shown that equality was not something that he possessed as he was cast out of heaven. And so then man is created and Satan going to and fro, and he comes and he comes first to woman. He comes first to woman. And I think that's very significant. He says to Eve, taste this fruit, Eve. Taste this fruit. But even more importantly, Eve, don't go back and talk to Adam about it. Don't go back and submit to the leadership of your life. Don't go back and talk to this man from whom you were created. Just eat it. Make your own decision, Eve. It's okay to be your own person, Eve. It's okay to stand on your own two feet, Eve. It's okay. You're just as important as him anyway, aren't you? Surely God loves you just as much as he loves him. Surely God would be okay with you doing this, Eve. Surely God would be okay, Eve, with you usurping the authority of the man that God has given you. Eve, go ahead and eat. And so Eve ate. <laughs> Because she's just as important as Adam. She doesn't need to discuss it with Adam. She's on the same playing field as Adam. We see how that turned out, don't we? We see how that played out. Sin entered the world through that string of decisions. And I don't think it's coincidental that when Satan sought to tear apart the world with sin, he went through the relationship backwards. He went through the relationship backwards. He went to woman, and then woman went to man. Now, I would question Adam's ability to be a leader as that he let the roles be reversed, and suddenly he was submitting to his wife, saying, okay, I'll eat with you. But then again, I forgive Adam, because I think of how many times my wife's eating cake and said, Jason, you want some? Of course I'm going to eat cake, right? This is an apple. He, or maybe not an apple. It says it was a fruit. Let me rephrase that. We don't know if it's an apple or not. Some fruit. Adam had never eaten of it. Suddenly Eve's eaten of it. She's not dead, so he thinks, why not? He wasn't leading either, but she certainly wasn't submitting to the leadership in her life. So Satan kind of contorted it. And so that's why women, we're supposed to, the, your, your submission starts to realize that your husband is your head. Now there's a lot of debate about that word that, that husband is the head of the wife as to whether it could be, it's, it's kind of interpreted the source. And so a lot of women's uh, rights movement non-Christian authors would say, well, biblically it doesn't say that he's the head in terms of a leadership. It says he's the source as in Adam was the source of Eve. But I would go further as to say 
it's really the only word there that Paul could have used to even give any suggestion. And I think it's very obvious in all the language when it talks about Christ being the head of the church. It's not talking about him being the source of the church. It's talking about him being the Lord of the church, the leader of the church, the Savior of the church. So I feel pretty confident that when Paul writes about wives submitting to their husbands, he's not talking about wives and husbands being on the equal field, that he's their source. I feel confident saying that, that Adam is the head of wife. He's the leader of his wife. Man is the leader of his wife. And so let's look at a third point about submission from verse 24. And it's this, the church is the ultimate model of submission. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And so the marriage between two believers, it should look beautifully different than the marriage between lost people. The love of a husband for his wife and the submission of a wife should look like the tender and special relationship between a lost soul and its Savior. It should mirror the way the church looks when it realizes that Jesus is its Savior. When a lost soul comes to know Jesus, a marriage should look the same way. They should be so in love with one another and so submissive to one another and so enamored with one another that the world could look at that marriage and tell it was different. Jesus is the head of the church, the same as the man is the head of the wife, and it's something that should glorify God. It should be a beautiful thing. But unfortunately, I'm afraid our Christian marriages don't often look that way anymore. Because too often we, we misdefine our roles. We sit through a series in which men are commanded to love their wives and women are commanded to submit to their husbands. And we listen to it and we say, yeah, I got that. That's what I'm supposed to do. And then we go about doing the same thing we've always done. Living our lives the way we've always lived it. We don't ever let it sink in. We don't ever let it do anything. And I think part of the problem is because we don't often go anything past what we've already talked about. We don't ever say anything besides wives. Submit to your husbands as you would to Jesus. Submit to Jesus first and then to your husband. That's what you do. But I'm going to take it a step further. Ladies, I'm going to give you a few practical thoughts that stem from the process of being a spirit-filled woman and submitting to your husband. And the first thing is to have a servant's heart for your husband's. A servant's heart for your husbands. How can you put this into play in your life? How can you submit to your husband in your marriage? First, have a servant heart. This means cook, clean, make his sandwich, make his tea whenever he's hungry or thirsty and don't make him ask you. <laughs> Got that? <laughs> Listen, y'all can't blame me for trying, can you? <laughs> Seriously. Ladies should seek to serve their husbands, realizing what we learned early on in our series, and it's this, that woman completes her man. That the man is incomplete without his wife. The man is incomplete without his wife. We had man, but he was lacking, so God created woman. And what a good thing it was. We said Adam wrote the first love song right there. As soon as he saw a woman, he became a poet. And we've been struggling ever since. Genesis 2.18 says, Ladies, that you were designed to be a helper, suitable for him. So this is your practical application. Put on your servant heart. Be a helper to your husband. Be a helper. The Hebrew word that is used for helper, when it says that in Genesis, that word literally is the same word that's used when it talks about God helping his people. When God helps his people in the Old Testament, the same word is used. So ladies, what I want you to realize is you have a transformational power within your possession to help your husbands. The same way that God helped his people. That same word is used to describe the help that you should have for your husbands. You are his only helpmate. His only helpmate that God created specifically for him is you. You should be encouraging your husband, praying for your husband, lifting up your husband, helping your husband to strive to submit to God in his life. And ladies, I'll tell you, just like I did the men. If you'll remember way back when I talked to the men and I said, men, if you come to me with a complaint about your wife, I can't believe she this or that or this or that or this or that or this or that. I'm going to point to you and say, whose fault is it? It's your fault. You're the leader of your household. And if your wife is in all that God has called her to be, it's not her fault. It's your fault. Ladies, if your husband is not what God called him to be, it's not just his fault. It's your fault. What are you doing to lift him up? When was the last time that you went into your closet and prayed that God would 
would create in your life a husband that was honoring him? When was the last time that you tried to lift your husband up instead of tearing him down? When was the last time that you tried to be his helper and not his boss? When was the last time that you tried to come along beside him instead of pushing him from behind? That's my question to you because you are his helper. Not you can be his helper. It's not an optional checkbox. It is what you are. You are his helper. So ladies, how do you submit to your husbands? Help them. Help them. God knows we need it. God knows we need it. And let me ask you this. If you, if you went to your closet and you prayed for your husband that God would cause him to be what God had called him to be, and you came back out of your closet, did you submit to your husband? Because if you didn't come out of your closet submitting to your husband and following his lordship in your life, then you didn't really believe that God could create what you prayed for. You just went in there for some reason beyond me and you came back out and treated him the same way as you did before you went in because you didn't really think God could change him. <clears throat> Sorry to pick on you ladies, I don't normally do this. So the first thing you can do is help. The second thing you can do is respect. Respect your husbands. See, love and respect in a marriage kind of go in a circle. You kind of write one on the top and one on the bottom with arrows pointing clockwise. Men are to love their wives. And Ephesians 5.33 said, wives, you are to respect your husbands. And it kind of goes clockwise. As long as you put in... It continues to grow. You want to know how to cause your husbands to love you more? Respect him more. Men, you want to know how to cause your wives to respect you more? Then love her more. And it kind of goes in a circle like that. Stop loving your wife and watch the respect slow way down. Stop respecting your husbands and watch the love slow way down. Every single time I talk to a married couple, every single time... We can trace it back to that circle and see that eventually the love and respect slowed down. Now sometimes things are done that break that circle, but that's where we have to get back for a marriage to be honoring God. And so the second practical application, first help your husband, and second is respect your husband. Respect him. Now to respect your husband doesn't mean that you never lovingly tell him when he's out of line in his thinking. It doesn't mean that you're not allowed to go to your husband and say... You're heading in the wrong direction, or I think you should consider something else. Remember, you are still his helper. You're not allowed to get rid of that responsibility to pick up the responsibility of respect. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought that perhaps there's a difference in the way that you provide correction to your spouse? There's a difference in the way that you say things to your spouse. There is a kind of correction that is helpful, and there is a kind of correction that is disrespectful and unhelpful. Relate it to your workplace. Relate it to any workplace you've ever been in. If your boss comes to you and kindly asks you to do something, you're fairly likely to do it with a smile, or at least a, a servant attitude. But if your boss comes down from on high and says, I can't believe you idiots screwed up everything you've done all week. Now we're going to work Saturday. I need you in here at 5 o'clock in the morning. The rest of the day, you're going to grumble and complain and moan and everything else. Now, you may come in Saturday at 5, but you ain't going to be happy about it. You're not willfully submitting to your boss. You're grudgingly submitting to your boss. And so, ladies, have enough respect for your husband to realize that he is the man that God gave to you. I'm sorry. It's not my fault. As of yet, I haven't married not one of you in this congregation, so you can't blame me, all right? He's the man that God gave to you. Maybe he's heading in the wrong direction. There's a big difference between... And men, I want you to tell me if I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I want you to tell me later so it don't mess my sermon up. There's a big difference between, honey, I understand where you came up with that plan. But would you consider this? Because I see if you carry on the way you're heading and the way you were going to do it, you could potentially hurt their feelings and... I'm not sure you want to do that. Maybe you should reconsider and, and maybe just look at doing it this way. 
Men, would you accept that encouragement from your wives? And if you wouldn't, then pray that God would cause your pride to go away, okay? But there's a big difference between that and... Well, you doggone idiot, can't you tell you're going to make everybody mad if you do that? I cannot believe that you ain't done thought of that. Why, how in the world could you not see that you're going to make her mad if you do that? You cannot do that. <laughs> Big difference. Ain't no respect in that second way, is there? There's only you moron. Let me tell you what you ought to be. Do you know what men hear when women start that? <laughs> I just wanted to let y'all know what we hear when you do that. That's why we look at you like this. You're talking in tongues. Hang on, let me let me go get an interpreter. I need I need somebody else. What about this? The things you say, not just to your husband, but the things you say about your husband. The things you say about your husband to other people show how much you respect your husband. Ladies, there's nothing more God-honoring than a gossip circle. Just kidding, I'm perfectly tickled when ladies of the church get together. But inevitably, I know this because I've walked up and heard you do this before. Ladies begin to discuss their husbands when they're in circles together. It's okay. But here's what I want you to think about. The things that you say about your husband to your friends, to your co-workers, to your mothers, to your aunts, to your grandmothers, the things that you say about your husband to them affect the way they think about your husband. Affect the outlook that they now have on your husband. So while it was innocent and you love him with all your heart and you're just venting, the person that you're venting to suddenly has a different opinion of your husband than they had before. Do they have a more respectful opinion of him by the way you're talking about him or do they wonder if you even love him? Let's take it a step further though, beyond just that thought. If you constantly call your husband a big dummy to somebody, they believe that that's what he is. But how about this? We want our husbands to glorify God and lead our houses and lead in our churches. So if you constantly talk about your husband like he's incapable of leading your house or incapable of doing anything or incapable of accomplishing anything on time, and then your husband steps up and says, I would like to be the head of the revival committee then what are the people of the church that have heard you talk about what an idiot he is going to think about him being on the revival committee? They go, well, I don't know about Charles being the head of anything. You heard the way Dot talks about him? And it's all warranted. That's, in your case, it's different. And we know that. His own wife doesn't think he can do anything. Why would we trust him heading up the revival committee of the church? Ladies, respect your husbands. Not just in what you say to him, but what you say about him. Believe it or not, the way that you treat your husband with respect is going to affect the other side of that circle and how much love he shows you. Because that's what fuels men. If I'm telling you something wrong, men, tell me later. But men, whether they care to admit it or not, Sometimes we need to have our ego brushed just a little bit. We need to know that our wives respect us. Guess what? It's not a character flaw. It's the way we were made. We were made for that. We like to be respected. We like to be needed. We like to know that we can fix things. Not going to apologize for who we are. But now you know. So you no longer have an excuse not to respect. And what about the last thing? So ladies, help your husbands. Respect your husbands. And in Titus 2 and 4 says, ladies, you're to love your husbands. Ladies, you're to love your husbands. Titus 2, 4 specifically says, Older wives of the church, you're to teach the younger wives how they are to love their husbands. You're to show them how much you love the, your husband. 
and show them that they should love their husband the same way because that is the key to happy marriages is in the way that you love your husband and respect your husband and husbands how you love your wives. Now, I'm not going to go over the attributes of love again. We've done that uh, exhaustively over the last couple of weeks as we talked about men loving their wives sacrificially and caring and cleansing and all of these things. But ladies, you're going to have that same love for your husbands. But even more than that, you're to let him know that you not only love him, that you not only cherish him, but that that love is not going away. It's eternal. It's not something he can lose. He's not going to make one, one mistake today in the way that he leads you and suddenly lose your love for an eternity. He's got to know that you're in his corner and that you love him. He's got to know that the love rank in your life looks like this. You love Christ. You love your husband. Then you love your kids, your family, your jobs. All these other things. Your husband has got to know that the only thing in this world that you love more than you love him is Jesus Christ. And that, as much as I hate to say it, is the demise of many marriages today that are otherwise successful and happy. Is that husbands feel like it's Jesus, then the kids, and then me. It's not the way God ordained it. It's not the way God ordained it. Now I know what you're going to say, ladies. But I need to be the mom that God called me to be. God gave me these children and I love them so much and I need to be the mom that God called me to be. And if I'm going to be that, I've got to put them at the top of the list. I've got to put them at the forefront of the list. No, you don't. No, you don't. Yes, you have to consider them and take care of them and raise them and love them with your husband whom you love first because God gave him to you. God gave him to you just as much as he gave the kids to you. And if you want your kids to grow up in the house that you have imagined them to grow up in, then you need to show them that their father is the most important thing in your life on this earth. That their father comes before everything else on this earth. That you've got Jesus and then daddy. And if you show your kids that, then I promise all these things that you want to show your kids and you think you've got to put them on the pedestal and put them first in order to give them, all those things will take care of themselves because they'll grow up knowing that mama and daddy loved each other more than anything in this world. Mama and daddy loved each other. How many households would be changed if parents would focus on loving one another more than they focused on loving kids? If parents focused on giving each other what they need instead of giving the kids what they want? Listen, I'm as guilty or more than anybody of spoiling my kids beyond all recognition. I get it. All right, so I'm not throwing stones from inside a glass house. But what I'm saying is that to be in a God-honoring marriage, ladies, you are to love your husbands Second only to Christ. I get so tired of hearing men in churches make this comment. Well, I liked church over at J&D Baptist where Brother John was the pastor. He and I really had a connection and I was serving over there. I was teaching Sunday school. and But, you know, Kim said there was a lot more for the kids to do over at B&B &B Missionary Baptist. And so we went over there because, you know, it's important for my kids to get to go on the mission trips. And so I'm going to be a good husband. And I, I'd like church over there a lot better. And I don't really much care for this preacher. I can't hardly listen to him. And I ain't learned nothing in a year. But by golly, my kids, they get to really enjoy the summertime programs where they go to the Jimmy Floyd. Can you tell me how many trips to the Jimmy Floyd are going to eternally influence that child's life more than if their daddy was getting fed in church, learning to serve God, and stepping up and being what God called him to be? 
The husband has got to be the spiritual leader of the house. The wife has got to submit to Christ and then submit to her husband. And by submitting to her husband, submit to Christ. It is that role. And I'm sorry, ladies, that you have been called to submission, but at least you weren't called to the responsibility of leadership. Because with that comes great responsibility. When God came and he talked to Adam and Eve before he cursed them, he knew that Eve had taken the fruit first, but he went to who first? Adam. Men, we got the brunt end of the stick on the responsibility. Ladies, you got the brunt end of the stick on the submission. That's just the way it is. So we have to love our husbands. So how can we submit to our husbands practically? What can you do today? What can you do tonight? One, you can be your husband's helper. You can respect your husband. And you can love him behind only Jesus. Proverbs 31, I'll challenge you to go and read it yourselves. Proverbs 31, I believe it starts in the 10th verse. It says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her worth is worth more than rubies, more than jewels. So ladies, I challenge you to be a Proverbs 31 woman. One who lifts your household, supports your husband, submits to your husband, and loves God. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for another opportunity to be present in your house, Lord God. We thank you that your word reveals to us the simplest of things, Lord. How to be better husbands, how to be better wives, Lord God. And it would be my plea, Lord God, that through this study of your word that the marriages in this church, Lord, would draw nearer to you. That the husbands would love their wives unconditionally and sacrificially and their wives would submit to their husbands as they submit to you, Lord. God, I know when the foundation in a marriage is in Christ alone, Lord. All the squabbles and all the difficulties and all the problems and all the shortcomings God, they can be worked through in you, Lord. So God, help us to focus on you in our marriages. And it's in your most precious heavenly name we pray. Amen.